each time it's really hard for me to find the parking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, hey, I'm uh, Thanks for coming to our meetup. Uh, we are Iotech. Auto scalable, uh, very recently production for Internet of Things. So today's agenda. I'm going to talk about the, about the, uh, what is Airtech, and uh, we will have Zhijie uh, to talk about the uh, road depots, our in-house in uh, consensus model, and uh, do a key studio service, that is a research paper we just published in a research uh, academic conference. Before getting into uh, details, let me introduce uh, all the speakers. Uh, first of all, me. Uh, I did a PhD uh, in machine learning and uh, computer vision uh, in uh, National University of Singapore. Before starting Altex, I was at uh, Facebook. And uh, while I was spending a uh, very long period, uh, seven, over seven years at Facebook, I also did some Android investment and uh, advised a few uh, startups. Um, and uh, Xin Xin, who is taking picture of me right now, uh, is a PhD in uh, uh, cryptography uh, from uh, University of Waterloo. And uh, before uh, joining the team, he was in uh, Bosch and he did uh, 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 14 years of research in uh, cryptography has, and had uh, over uh, 40 uh, publications. And Zhi uh, Jie, uh, he was uh, at Facebook uh, jo before joining uh, Facebook. He also got uh, his PhD from National University of Singapore. And uh, he, he did a lot in uh, P2P networking and uh, database in the past. He was all, uh, before Facebook, he was at uh, Hortonworks. So we, this is, uh, we will have three speakers. And uh, yeah, uh, we have a, a relatively good size of audience. We have a good ratio. Today, so uh, starting uh, from what is Altex, we all know Internet of Things has huge potential in the future. According to a lot of different research, uh, it could be a uh, trillion dollar market uh, in next to two decades. It's not what I said. It's uh, according to some research report. And uh, even right now, there are many applications and uh, around us that are powered by IoT, including like the projector, speaker, and different things. Whenever they connect to the internet, they are considered an internet of things. And uh, there, there could be even more and more. Do we have a pointer here? Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. So you can see around you, in your home, there are quite a different type of uh, IoTs and uh, in your offices and uh, uh, factories and also work site, outside in the city, in the vehicles, you can see a lot of different type of IoTs. And uh, oh by the way, can I do a quick poll? And uh, how many have you guys uh, bought Bitcoin or any other uh, coin or tokens? Six. Everybody has this kind of context. And how many of you are actual developers? You're actually coding? That's good size, yeah. Luckily, we prepared just for developers today. We, did, we are not going to uh, go through a lot of like, marketing details. And uh, this is the only slide we are, we are doing that. And uh, Altex. Altex bring trusted machine uh, economy to IoT. What does it mean? Altex bring trusted layer. All the IoT devices, they can, they can trust each other. The, the data provided by the IoT devices are trusted, and the network is trusted. So they can safely connect to each other and uh, coordinate with each other. Digitalization. No one is going to manipulate the data and control the data and uh, make use of the data unless you permit. And token incentive, different uh, projects or companies, and uh, yeah, in the future it might be just uh, projects, not the uh, companies in the future. And uh, they can provide token incentive. They can have their own blockchain, and, uh, and uh, having token incentive to incentivize all the users and uh, 
and uh, the developers to work on to use their uh, product. Privacy. Privacy is a, a key feature. Without privacy, uh, IoT cannot connect. I, I, most people are not comfortable about uh, getting their, I, their uh, IoT devices to connect to the blockchain because right now, currently, most blockchain are very open and transparent and their data, all the data are public. Whenever they know your, your wallet address, they know everything. And if your, all the IoT devices are actually related to people, like your personal life, your, 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 your car, uh, and also your health data. If they're connected uh, with the blockchain without any protection, that'd be a disaster. And uh, this is what uh, Altex can solve the current problem that IoT uh, systems. And on the privacy side, uh, I just mentioned a little bit, but the, the, in, in, the, in the current stage, all the data are stored in the cloud. And, uh, all, and the cloud being uh, controlled by certain uh, giant companies. And they, like Facebook, for example, Google, Amazon. And also, they, can be, they are also starting in a particular data center. And you, you can never know how they protect your data. There might be some problem that they didn't protect well and they've been leaked. And also, they can, they can for sure use your data for some, uh, for some purpose without even letting you know. And uh, we did a lot on the privacy uh, protection. Yeah. Uh, later, Xi Jinping will present uh, the paper that they call we protect the, uh, the data on, on the blockchain. And uh, scalability and availability. Um, the, when IoT startups, when they operate uh, their IoT on the cloud, the cost, the operation cost, grows uh, exponentially with, uh, with the size of the, the LT devices. The management cost is very high. And also, uh, most of the LTE companies, they are hardware driven. They are not very uh, familiar with software. Scalability can be a, a pinpoint for them. And availability. And uh, when you, as a user, when you buy a product, you, are, you expect it can run forever, unless the, the product is faulty and, uh, and uh, dies some, sometime. But sometimes the, the the company can even go can even can even go bankrupt in, even before your your uh, your, uh, your your hardware uh, uh, your, your hardware is dead. That means all the cloud will be shut down, and you wouldn't even use the the hardware. I have personal experience on this. Like when I when I, when I bought uh, all the camera, I searched online, and that company I have never heard about it. And I couldn't buy it because it's very likely that uh, the company went pivot and bought, and uh, so that their service can be shut down. And without the cloud, it's nothing. But uh, we can bring the availability to this type of like uh, devices. Interoperability. There, when the current the current way how it works is uh, the, the the devices are connected to the cloud, and the different cloud talk to each other somehow. But uh, this is really real, uh, but the reality is uh, most of the cloud do not talk to each other. Like Google never talk to Amazon, and and uh, they also set some barrier for other people to enter. And uh, as a result, it's really hard for, for all the devices to be connected. And uh, with the open source project, everyone can contribute to it. Everyone can connect to it. At least this is such a a, a new way for us to all bring all the connectivity to all the devices. This is how we can solve the existing IoT problems. And, uh, but what we are looking for is even make, how we can actually bring new economy uh, when we get IoT and the blockchain together. This is how we lay out. So IoT uh, blockchain is, uh, attack blockchain, we build, uh, uh, we call it a solution, this is architecture wise. And we also build the uh, SDKs, chain SDKs for all the developers, companies to build their own blockchain. In a system, we call it a subchain. And there could be one blockchain for shared economy, one for smartphone, one for uh, automated vehicles, and one for subchains. And on top of those subchains, there could be DFs and modules. DFs, DFs we can talk to one chain or multiple chains and uh, bring different functionality together and then can connect to different uh, devices. And uh, modules, they can enhance 
the different assumptions. And for example, like the IGI, it doesn't have to be a blockchain which kind of like solving the air problem. It will be the module that uh, listen to the chain and get the data and get back to the chain so that the other devices can act uh, based on the results. This is how we lay out the structure. And uh, you can also see this way. How we share another yeah. Uh, the difference between ha having the LT plus the blockchain to uh, to initiate a new uh, economy, you can see this way. Some of the, uh, there's a one example, like sharing Wi-Fi. You can think about this way. Uh, if there's a router company build a, a blockchain that can share the Wi-Fi to everybody, so that when, whenever people are using uh, their phone and laptop, they can just uh, use other others Wi-Fi. And, and this can be totally automatically uh, done on the, on the blockchain. It doesn't have to be like anyone in the middle. They're, they're, they're not going to be uh, kind of like a, a company who are saying, okay, let me connect, uh, let me buy all the routers, let me also like uh, uh, start this kind of business, and then I can make a profit by providing ads and the different things. This is the old business model. And uh, in the new one, when you have the token economy, when you have uh, the blockchain, you can get a community to contribute, and also get a community to contribute to, the, to, the, to sharing their devices out. And uh, any questions so far? Yeah, quick question for you. Yeah. Um, when we think of the device, we go back to the price yeah. like, um, uh, when we think of the Google uh, Apple one, is it interoperability? Um, when we talk about interoperability in IoT, are we talking about also IoT devices that may be controlled by large controllers like telephone companies? For example, the Verizon which controls most of the IoT devices that so we are thinking all forwards. When it can, uh, we are not uh, we are not talking about the connect uh, the IoT devices talk to the cloud and then talk to blockchain. We would like all the uh, IoT devices directly talk to blockchain. That means they probably can have two modes and. Uh, and uh, what, uh, one mode you can talk to the cloud, one mode talk to the blockchain. And talking to the blockchain, they can definitely listen to the data from the blockchain so that they can talk to each other. Awesome. And will you need to negotiate um, providers to get your software onto their firmware? Given that, or to get your software onto these IoT devices, is that something that's going to be part of interoperability, or is that something else? Uh, Maybe I think uh, we, we, we would uh, go for like uh, getting the manufacturers directly building new products okay. that can talk to each other. For the existing ones, it's really hard for them to only upgrade their, uh, their hardware. Probably they can, but uh, it's not a uh, very good uh, instinct for them to do that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so is this your own uh, Is this your own design of like uh, the open standard board? Uh, taking the data, this the structure of the data that can be used, uh, the IoT device to be sending right now, there's so many standards mm -hmm. that uh, IoT devices, the way the IoT devices generate the data. That's one of the issues is that uh, nobody can talk to each other because the way the data is generated is not standardized. Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, so many standards that it's not standardized. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I think uh, the way how to do it is getting all the community members also to define the ways so that they can talk to each other, not having someone to, they can be somehow powerful and they define some format, and another power, uh, powerful party define another standard. That they wouldn't talk to each other. But on this kind of like, uh, a collaborative uh, way and on the, on, the, on the blockchain, they can, they can actually do that. And also, you can think about this way. Uh, when we have different subtrains, and different subtrains, they can even have their own standard, but however, uh, when we are designed, when, when we are designed the cloud chain communication, that can be also like, a, uh, that can be some connectors for them to uh, relay the data and so that uh, to the format everyone can understand. So that it can be standardized. 
Can you pick the format for your system? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, I mean, yeah, so right now, yeah, so right now we are uh, working on the auction side. Yeah, we haven't uh, get into that stage that we have to force uh, different parties to talk to each other yet. And also, I, I think the, the uh, I think in the future, uh, the first steps would be getting those type of like uh, projects or companies to start doing this. And uh, then, at the same time, we should figure out uh, we should have a way for different people to have the improvement plan to get the standard standardized. He's building an IoT blockchain, and I'm building an IoT blockchain. Yeah. Right? So what, what we're going towards is a world where there are, instead of several standards, mm -hmm. several IoT blockchains. And we're basically going to repeat the problem that exists. Uh, but, yes. uh, but, the, but the good thing is, all, all your blockchains are open, and everybody can contribute so that it will go, go to the way that it can talk to each other. It's not like you are, because you have a blockchain, that may sound like you have a cloud, you do not even let other people to connect. In that way, you, you can never reach such a consensus. One more question. Yeah, um, sure. What could be the cost? Can you, can you estimate what's the cost of basically sending the data and communicating the data? Right? If you're looking at this parallel to building something on top of Ethereum is, you know, incredibly expensive. Yeah, so we, we thought about that. Uh, so uh, the, our consistent model is uh, improved version of uh, EOS. So that is uh, kind of, it's sort of the people, but we improve that. And then we will come out, we will uh, that later. Yeah. So the cost would be much lower than it is for sure. And but there are still some cost, for sure. Because, because of blockchain, uh, because of the nature of blockchain, and the uh, blockchain, because of blockchain, because of nature of blockchain, and and you, you, you gain something, you also need to pay for it a little bit. And also because there are no cloud, so that uh, someone has to pay for the min miners. So, so do, do you know if the super nodes themselves uh, maintain the ledger? Second, sorry? Did the super nodes, the master nodes themselves maintain the ledger? Oh, yes. Uh, we'll get into details later. Yeah. That's your, you guys are delegated to go to the talk about soon, right? Yes. Let's get to it. Yes. Can do it quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we make it work? <laughs> uh, we have a, this we call it a road divorce. This is an in-house uh, consistent model that we have randomized the delegates to our stake. So which means uh, we have a large pool of the uh, uh, delegates, and then uh, for each uh, we call it apple, and uh, we have. Random selected uh, uh, delegates to, do, to, 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 to be the uh, block producer. This is uh, our improvement, but uh, technically it's also very, it's still very hard. Yeah, we are, we are going to get details how, 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 to, how, we, how do we make it work. And uh, we also have a uh, uh, privacy uh, uh, pre uh, preserving algorithm. And uh, uh, we, we have three different uh, techniques to provide the sender, receiver, and also the Data itself, and we also have a blockchain in blockchain architecture. That is all what we call the auto scalable. That uh, because uh, no matter how you improve the blockchain, and uh, you you still cannot uh, reach the you, you still have the risk to reach the moment that when the connect when, when the nodes connecting to the blockchain is uh, is too many, and uh, the transactions they are sending are too many, you, you basically still get jammed. And uh, recently, there is another uh, app on Ethereum called Form 3D that makes uh, the all transactions really high, and uh, people are suffering from that. And uh, having this kind of like a blockchain to blockchain, everybody can create their own blockchain, but in the architecture, it's called the subchains. And uh, so it's kind of like a, a auto scalable, and uh, also the delegates pool will also also auto scale based on the number of subchains. Go ahead, yeah. Is the uh, subchain architecture analogous to sidechains in Bitcoin or uh, other blockchains? Uh, it's yeah, I think it's a little bit different, uh, different uh, because uh, the 
the subchain itself is a fully functional blockchain. It's also uh, uh, very decentralized. For yeah. And uh, when we have all this architecture, the another one we are thinking is autonomous uh, device uh, coordination. And uh, this is more related to the smart contract. So we are also designing smart contracts that can uh, talk to uh, different uh, subjects. So that uh, all devices, when they connect to different subjects, they can uh, use uh, smart contract to, to get connected. So the, basically, the DApps can actually uh, run in this way. OK. I would uh, talk a uh, little bit more about the blockchain blockchains architecture, and uh, uh, GDA will get into the real depots. So this is the uh, overall architecture, how it, how it works. We have the root chain uh, in the middle. That, and, uh, that is a very lightweight blockchain. And, uh, it, it, the, the main purpose for the JS blockchain is to hold the tokens and also do the sub, uh, uh, the subchain governance. And for the subjects, there could be uh, for the subjects, there could be different uh, uh, kind of settings, including the privacy settings, including like uh, other advanced features that we may introduce in the future. And all the devices will talk to, uh, will connect to the uh, uh, to the to the subchain instead of the root chain. And uh, the subject can talk to another subject, uh, either related by the root chain, or in the future, we might also design some algorithm for them to talk to each other directly. And uh, also, I'll give a little bit of uh, uh, interaction about this as well. Uh, think, think, think about this diagram, and uh, all the devices are, uh, when we are thinking, uh, how the blockchain can connect to the real world. IoT devices are uh, really a good, good way. Because the IoT devices, when you put in some security model there, and uh, all the data can be trusted. And uh, all the data they recorded uh, can, 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 can get back to the blockchain uh, securely and trust, uh, in a trusted way. And uh, devices, they also listen to the event on the blockchain so that they can react uh, uh, based on the blockchain uh, results. Like I said earlier, uh, if, if there are some modules that can modify the blockchain in certain ways, and uh, the, the device can also react uh, based on that as well. So this is, can make it a loop. And the devices can also uh, either uh, propagate the data to the, to the subchain, and, or maybe they can uh, use the, the blockchain to buy some resources for them to use, like uh, bandwidth, like uh, storage, like uh, other things. So all of them together as a loop, they can be considered as uh, what we are uh, talking about as uh, autonomous uh, device coordination. Any questions on this part? Yeah, right. To what degree, what measures have you tested to uh, validate the uh, security and safety amongst autonomous devices that are shared? You know, and what, and how do you know it's approved? How do you know it's that secure? You're speaking very confidently on like, uh, the security. Yeah. What have you done? That's, that's yeah, the secure part, uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah. So, the secure part is uh, when the data uh, being recorded by one LT device, we know it's from that LT device because the LT device can have a secure module that holds its own private key so that uh, the data is being signed by the, uh, the transaction is being signed by the by the uh, IoT device, so no one can uh, uh, no one can can malicious uh, uh, fake the, the transaction. Besides the device manufacturer. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And uh, that compared to the traditional block, uh, to compared to other uh, ways to upload the data, that you always have this kind of uh, issue that uh, if you are think thinking about talking to a uh, Oracle and uh, and. Uh, and a lot of people are using some voting uh, mechanism to, to get the data. But if you use LT, that could be a solution that you can, uh, that can be uh, more trusted than, than the more voting. Because voting can also uh, fix the result, I mean, not fix, but there is some incentive for you to uh, misuse the voting in some way. Is the device in node on the chain? 
Uh, they, I would say uh, it depends on their functionality. And it could be a lightweight uh, client, it could be a uh, uh, kind of a partner node, it could be a full node. So how do you identify the device on the chain? And uh, if I temper, if I, you know, a malicious actor temper with the device, and then basically send data that's changed because of temper device, I can write itself. Can you verify that? Uh, so I think uh, currently, I, I think. Uh, yeah, is it? Yeah, maybe yeah. I can ask so okay. What you can do is you can do the remote attestation to see whether the device still behave as you expected, or is there any malicious code that being injected to the device to go there? And that's what you can do. Other way, you can also view the internalized uh, identity management system on top of the blockchain to match all other devices. So a basic way. You can provide you can you can also check the script status of your device. What do you mean by unit index? How do you how do you design your unit index? Uh yeah, that's the only on uh depends on the functionality of your your device. Uh for very cheap device, I guess you can you can get the digital security, uh do the manufacturer process. So usually the the way it works, uh, you have a box uh device. The, from your, your production line, and then you have a certificate authority to generate machine to machine computer certificate in the contact format. Then those certificates will be intact in your device in the manufacturer place, and uh, this uh, this certificate can be used to identify the guys when they join the uh, when they join the network. Yeah. How do you guys handle either two opposing uh, like events? At the same time, through like a large network, or if you have downtime and you have a severed like blockchain of blockchain, how do you uh, get a consensus back on which chain takes precedent? Uh, that sounds a very difficult question. Can you get it back to this later? Yeah, because we have a lot of cover right now. Yeah. Uh, so right now we have a. a uh, to uh, talk about our road demos, and we also have a demo and uh, how it works. And uh, later, Xinjiang will get into the, our privacy uh, techniques. Okay, yeah, to Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's go get in the queue. All right. <coughs> Hello everybody, uh, this is Richard Jin from Tech. Uh, I'm a uh, software engineer here. Uh, so Don has introduced uh, uh, a few innovations from the IOTEX and uh, uh, in the next section, I'm going to provide more details about the Rody Post, which is one of the biggest innovation for our blockchain. Um, so just to be one step back before we introducing our Rody Post mechanism, uh, let's go through the what is going to be the consensus of blockchain. Uh, you know, there's a, for blockchain has the collaboration is about a, a set of nodes on different places, and uh, they always they also having a copy of the ledgers on their nodes. Right? They need to have the uh, some sort of agreement they have a uh, record the same results and then they are going to take the same action this is why we need to have a consensus different nodes on in the network and talk to each other and decide this is the thing you want to do um, <clears throat> I think the uh, uh, birth of the blockchain the Bitcoin we have uh, invented uh, a few um, uh, consensus mechanisms uh, uh, like the uh, <coughs> proof of work, like the proof of stake, and uh, recently the delegated proof of stake. They have a uh, they have uh, cons and uh, pros here and there. Um, uh, so they have a trade off between the throughput, uh, finality, decentralization, all sorts of these things. And uh, we do a lot of research. <coughs> And we find the delegated proof of stake is the good choice, as it's going to have the uh, the, uh, the feature to limit the uh, 
consensus protocol just uh, among us, a, a small set of nodes so that we can reach the consensus quickly and provide a high TPS throughput for, for the applications. But on the other hand, compared to the proof of work and the proof of stake, the traditional consensus methods. But on the other side, we also we are also aware of the, the, the delegated uh, uh, proof of stake has its uh, problems because you limit it to a small set of nodes, right? You you are trade off the uh, the decentralization. This is where we want to put our innovation into. So I have high level what our road post is is uh, we are going to um, choose uh, a, a, a wider array, a wider delegation pool, and uh, among this pool, then we will have some um, algorithm that backed by, backed by the cryptography to guarantee we will fully randomize fully randomly choose a small set of delegates to do the block producing. So in this slide, I'm going to uh, highlight the four key components that we have for the rolling post consensus. So the first of, first of them is uh, we want like to choose uh, who are going to be the block producer. So we need the uh, uh, block producer selection mechanism. This is uh, through the delegate the pool. So what, how, how the pool works? So for the first of all, step is uh, for um, a node participating to this network, it needs to uh, issue an action to nominate itself to be the, uh, to say I'm, I'm willing to be the block producer. And uh, all the participants, no matter you operate a node or you, or you just uh, own the tokens in this network, right? You can you can use your token. This is the power for you to vote the, uh, who who you want to want this guy to be the block producer. So there could be a lot, right? Could, could, uh, hopefully there will be thousands or even tens of thousands of people are willing to be the produce, block producer. But we just will have a short list, like uh, uh, for example, 100 or maybe 500 uh, top, uh, um, top block producers which have aggregated most of the votes. And, uh, and within this a small, uh, small uh, set of uh, candidates, then we can select uh, uh, by using the our cryptography uh, algorithm to randomly choose the a set of the nodes that will be uh, uh, the block producer for an apple. The apple, the concept we have introduced is that you can think of these uh, several rounds of the uh, consensus, and during this uh, this round, uh, we will always uh, delegate this part of uh, people, this part of block producer nodes, to uh, to run the consensus and produce the blocks for for the whole network. Yeah. So we now we have the how we figure out who will be the block producer. The next one is how these producers uh, agree with each other. The, the uh, mechanism we choose is the PBFT, which stands for the practical batting time for tolerance. So we, we implemented this uh, uh, consensus algorithm and we have our own improvements to make sure it's going to reach the instant finality. That means once a block has been created, then the, your transaction is finalized. We don't have a chance that another block will uh, replace this one or we have a fork, fork of the blockchain. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the third part, which is also a pretty important piece of our consensus, Mechanism is a random beacon. So this is the uh, some um, very hard hardcore um, uh, 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 cryptography stuff that is going to uh, you can think of we were going to create some secrets and uh, in each block so that after 
after sell, after a round of epoch, we are going to accumulate enough secrets that's going to be able to determine the seeds and determine who will be in the next uh, epoch's uh, delegate so that we can make sure. Uh, so first, from epoch to epoch, we are always going to do some kind of switch uh, from this group of delegates and to the other group of delegates from the candidate pool. And also, this will not be uh, uh, predicted in advance. And uh, the last but not least part is, uh, I think Don also has mentioned, we, we have the, the, the root chain, side chain architectures. So, the, our our uh, consensus is also trying to support this uh, architecture. The, that's why we need to have a larger pool. And for this pool, we are not only going to uh, uh, select the delegates who is going to produce blocks for the, uh, for, the for the root chain. It is also going to um, uh, select from this pool the people, the, the, the nodes who will support the block producing for the side chains. So this pool could be uh, pretty big, depends on the demands of the side chain, the whole ecosystem. So, uh, question? Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to clarify. Does that mean that the root chain pool like, creates the VPs for both the subchains as well, or do the subchains have their own governance over their own VPs? So, um, I think the both ways should, should be fine. But what I would like to uh, mention here is that uh, in this, in this uh, governance, we actually are uh, uh, talking about you usually start the, the side chain, and this side chain is also use the, the delegates, use the, use the nodes, block producer in this candidate pool to produce the, uh, the block for your side chain. So um, this could be actually the uh, configurable numbers. Uh, we are still doing the experiment to figure out uh, how long the, the we, it, how long the epoch should be in terms of number of uh, PBFT rounds. That is the sweet spot for us. The the idea is. Uh, uh, we would like to have it to be longer because uh, at the beginning of every epoch, we have some sort of additional, like like uh, like uh, additional work to the cryptography work to determine the 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 order of uh, block producing in this epoch. Right, this is going to take some effort to do. So we want to amortize it over the. The whole apple. That that said, the longer the apple is, and the the, the, the smaller the overhead per, per block. But uh, how how long it could be? How long is going to be the the most stable, uh, or most uh, re reliable apple? We we still in the investigation. Yeah. I follow up with that. I mean, I'm related, but potentially. So it basically sounds like. Uh, most other proofs they can do malicious, except that the validator set is randomly shifting, right? So if the validator set is randomly shifting, um, what what are the guarantees that that shift when the transition happens? Basically, another state change, right? So you go from state number one where your validator set is A, and then you go to state number two where your validator set is B, and in the middle, if 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 I was a device that last looked at the validator set A, I suddenly entered a world where the entire validator chain has changed. The validator set has changed. Um, does that mean now I now have to download the entire uh, history to validate this to check if this is a valid transition? Um, so uh, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but I'll try to uh, rephrase. Are uh, you actually talking about uh, for different uh, uh, block producers, they may not have the consistent view of the, the current ledger so that they cannot reach the consensus? Is this your question? Uh, my question is the, the, valid, the pool of validators mm -hmm. is shifting, right? That's what's yeah. happening, right? So when the pool shifts, 
Yeah, so first of all, you, you, like, like you have a thought, right? right. Your, your problem is not going to be the, the, the candidate. So you are not care about this, who is going to be the candidate. What you are going to do as a, as a, a lightweight note, you are going to just passively listen to the, the block updates from the network. When you get online, you will see the blocks from the network, right? And uh, the, the thing is, uh, we, for, for example, because of the network latency in different, uh, on different nodes, you probably will, um, so for example, I got the block, block 100, you got block 105. And uh, how, how do we know from block 100 to block 105 because of the new transaction happens, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the delegates could be shifting from this group of people to that group of people, right? So that's, we have some deterministic way uh, to make sure that everybody is going to agree on the same list of the delegates when started the, uh, the new epoch. If you are interested in this, we can talk about more tech details offline, but that will be very, very detailed stuff. Uh, so we're going to run out of time, so I want to make sure we get knocked out, so right, go for it. Okay, yeah, let, let's get into our demo, and if you're interested in more details, we can just chat offline. So uh, in the last uh, month, we have released our testnet uh, alpha, and uh, I would like to show the uh, our explorer. And in explorer, we have this sort of the rolling post animation. It can give you the uh, the, uh, the immediate concept of how this is uh, working. So you can see. Um, in, the, in this uh, uh, test net, we have set up uh, 21 candidates pool, and uh, every for every app pool, we will uh, nominate uh, seven nodes to be the block operators. We just uh, see the shift from one to the uh, new one. So another seven nodes has been chosen as the block producer for this app pool. They are highlighted in purple color here, and the flashing one. Is the, actually the uh, the current block producer. They they have some we have some way to make sure they are going to take a take the turn one by one. Yeah. The also we have a very cool uh, explorer. They have they listed some um, high high level blockchain metrics. Uh, each individual blocks and transfers and nodes. If you are interested in, just uh, you, uh, go ahead to play with it. Um, how can I get back to the slides? Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. Oh, this one. Yeah. This one. Yeah. yeah. This is uh, our, uh, our Explorer website. Oh, uh, that's your test net? Yeah, our test net. How long have you been live on test net? So we have uh, been running this test net through this, since the, uh, the end of June. And uh, we will do a, a testing uh, from time to time. I test uh, the supports and I test the new features. So sometimes we will restart and reset everything. Uh, cool. Uh, so next, our uh, uh, Dr. Xingqing is going to uh, continue the section about uh, privacy technologies. Alright, so uh, I'm happy to share with you guys about some uh, research we did a few months ago. Uh, the some small project. Uh, okay. Oh, yes. Okay, so uh, privacy for blockchain, uh, which actually is the focus for many uh, blockchain projects you, are, you may, might be aware of. Uh, when talking about these issues, firstly, so what's the motivation to consider the privacy in the, on the blockchain? Uh, so initially, uh, they have the Bitcoin network, or Ethereum, uh, 
uh, all the transaction just uh, post in plain text, and uh, yeah, everyone can uh, use Explorer to see what's the transaction, uh, what's the, the source of, and the destination of those transactions. Uh, so you may think you have the you have, you have a key pair, and no one know who you are because that key pair does not associate with your identity. Uh, unfortunately, if you conduct the traffic analysis on the blockchain network, uh, you, you can actually build a traffic analysis diagram uh, when combining with some third-party information or some other contacts. Uh, it's not that hard to identify uh, who sent those transactions exactly. So that's why people have a concern uh, about the privacy on the blockchain. Uh, some people just don't want to uh, leak those information to the public uh, for different different reasons. Uh, that's why we consider uh, yeah, privacy also a very important uh, aspect for the blockchain design. Uh, especially, uh, as, you, as you know, the IOTX blockchain also focuses on the IoT domain. Uh, IoT domain has very strong regulations, especially in Europe. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. You may know the GDPR got effect in the past few months, and uh, yeah, all the many uh, all the IoT manufacturers they are facing the new challenges. How to be compliant with uh, uh, very strong privacy law, and still can ensure the uh, operation of uh, of their IoT device in the fields. So basically, for us uh, to solving the private privacy issues, have two aspects. Uh, one is uh, on the blockchain side. Uh, if you think blockchain in a simple way, it's just a bunch of transactions. So you have sender, you have receiver, you have transaction value. That's the uh, three components you try to protect. Okay. So on the device side, on the other hand, you need to consider uh, how to protect the data collected from the device, uh, how to be compliant with uh, uh, different regulations uh, across the global. So uh, today, we, yeah, we will talk a little bit for the blockchain side. So uh, as I mentioned, you have three components, sender, receiver, and uh, transaction value. Uh, you try to keep private. Uh, so uh, for current status, uh, you, have a uh, you usually have the different technologies you can play with to enable those features on your blockchain. Uh, for example, if you want to protect uh, the sender's privacy. Basically, uh, you are going to do is hide yourself among a bunch of people uh, on the network. So the technology used there is called the ring signature. Uh, so uh, the idea is you send a signature on behalf of a group of people. So in this way, people don't know uh, where this transaction comes from, but they know it's come from a group. Uh, you just hide in the crowd. Okay, that's uh, uh, for the sender side. Uh, for the receiver side, uh, this is called the sales address technology. Uh, so basically, you can send one uh, multiple transactions to the same uh, to the same destination. However, when someone observes the blockchain transactions, they don't they don't know all these transactions targeted to the same person. Okay, this on the receiver side. Uh, for the transaction value, it's a little bit uh, uh, more complicated. Uh, basically, you need to prove uh, the, the relations between input and output. Also, you need to, to show the transactions correct, and all the input and output is within a certain range, uh, which usually using the technology called zero-knowledge proof. Uh, so that can hide the transaction value, and at the same time, prove uh, the transaction is correct and private. Okay, so these uh, three components uh, when you consider the privacy issues on the blockchain side. Uh, today we will yeah talk a little bit more for the for the receiver side. Uh, so I'm I'm going to talking about uh, the sales address device, which is a popular technology that have been used in in several blockchain projects to ensure the transaction privacy on the sender side. Uh, yeah, we may go over together uh, for the evolution of this technology, uh, which have already have been uh, have several iterations uh, for the design. Uh, also, uh, 
Yeah, we will also briefly review uh, what what we designed. Uh, the this DOP is still to address technology uh, for the IoT. Uh, the first part, we yeah, we just quickly go over the evolutions for this privacy enhancing technology together. Uh, so, the still to address is a privacy enhancing technology. So as I mentioned, it's, it's used to protect the privacy uh, of the sender on the blockchain transactions. So in a nut, uh, in a nutshell, they uh, still address the they use uh, they require a sender to create the one time and the random address for each transaction uh, on behalf of the rece receiver. So sender will, will, will generate the one-time random random light address and they send these transactions to this to those randomized address and uh, actually it's targeting to the same person as I show uh, in this figure. They send the transaction to a different address. Uh, however, it's sent to the same person. Okay. All those transactions uh, are unlinkable if you observe uh, the transactions on the blockchain. You see, they are sending to the different address, and, and you don't know uh, who the destination will be. However, yeah, some of the transactions actually send to the same person. So all the skills address design based on the elliptical cryptography. Uh, yeah, more specific, more specifically, they based on the uh, what they call the ECDH protocol, elliptical version of DT Hellman Higgs chain protocols. Uh, this product is quite simple. Uh, everyone has a, you have a key pair, you exchange key pair with your, yeah, the other communication party. And uh, I send public key to you and you send to me. I use my private key and you use your private key to doing the operations. And uh, after computation, you, everyone got the, both party get the same common secret. Okay, this uh, key exchange. All the previous designs uh, for still address based on this uh, protocols. So the first design is actually uh, in 2013, or oh, yeah, 2013 around that time. Uh, it's called the Basic Steel Address Protocols, uh, BISA for, for short. So this protocol actually is quite simple. Uh, you can simply just uh, directly apply uh, the ECDH protocols on the blockchain setting. Uh, both uh, sender and receiver have the key pair, uh, they just exchange the key pair. And uh, both sides compute the, uh, the common secret and apply the hash function to get the uh, get a shared secret. So each time sender uh, yeah, just simply, simply use uh, this common secret uh, yeah, uh, times the base point on the elliptic curve and send the uh, transaction to this destination address. So you can see this basic design has, has some disadvantages. Uh, the destination address actually is fixed uh, since both parties the key is fixed. So this destination address is fixed. And uh, both sender, both, yeah, sorry. Thank you. So both sender and the receiver, uh, they they both know the private key. Uh, here's a yeah, small C here. Both sender and the and the receiver know this key. This key will be used to spend your token you receive from the other side. So if both sender and receiver know, uh, which means the sender can get money back if he want. Okay. Uh, so this is a very first basic device. Uh, so the second one is an improved version uh, called ISOP. So we know from the first schemes they use a fixed key on both sides. So the improved scheme, the idea is to use a, random, a randomized key pair. So on the sender side, you can see now instead of using his fixed uh, key pair, he generates an ephemeral key pair, R and R times G. Uh, the rest of the protocol just follow the uh, ECDH. Uh, you compute the common secret and then apply the hash function to this one. 
However, from uh, for, for these protocols, each time you need to uh, send the transaction uh, to the new address, uh, which is a common secret times this uh, base point, uh, plus the public key of the receiver. Yeah, you can see from here, uh, each time the sender choose a different uh, ephemeral key pair, the desti destination address will be, will be different. So they will send to the transaction to the different address, uh, which, which looks less random. Okay. They, uh, we're almost there. Uh, however, this uh, improved design also has some dis disadvantage. So in this scheme, uh, blockchain node uh, they still need to use their private streaming key be here for actively scanning the blockchain to see whether this transaction is sent to him. Okay. So in terms of the security practice, uh, which is uh, you can feel it's not that that secure. If you you constantly using imagine you constantly using your wallet key to send something, it increases the chance that this key might be leaked. Okay. That's why you yeah for important transaction yeah like the Bitcoin or uh, you prefer the cold wallet. You store the long term key in a very secure storage. Okay, but for this scheme, you can see they are using the. Uh, this private spending key uh, to check the to scanning the blockchain transactions to see whether the trans transaction is sent to him. Okay. Uh, so this is a second scheme. So since we yeah since we have this problem using constantly using the private key, uh, next idea is to we yeah we split the task. Okay, we have two key pair. Why is using just for scanning the blockchain purpose to see whether this transaction is sent to me? And the other key pair is dedicated for the spending. Okay. In this way, you can put your, your spending key in the very secure storage and use your uh, scanning key just for scanning the blockchain to identify which transaction is sent to you. Okay. Uh, that's why we have the, yeah, this BOP schemes. Each party has a two pair of key. You can see it has a spending key and a scanning key. So when sender sender want to send your transaction, uh, they will still doing the elliptical version key exchange. But uh, instead of use, using your long term public key, they will use your scanning key for this purpose. Again, each time uh, when sender choose a different different R, you will get the different. Uh, that's the destination address which you can send the transaction to. Uh, yeah, this one, this version, yeah, is much better compared to the yeah previous previous version. Okay, so I just keep this uh, skip this this diagram. Basically, show uh, what they what they are doing. Uh, you can see for this type of sales sales transactions, uh, besides sending the destination. Uh, address or public key, uh, the value you try to send, you also need to contain your ephemeral public key on the sender side you generated before sending these transactions. Okay. So receiver side, they just doing the uh, key exchange protocols and the scanning blockchain to see uh, which one is sent to me. But they need to scan every transactions. Okay. Uh, what's this used for in practice? Actually, they have a number of products already using this or realize this in their blockchain systems. They have a couple of uh, wallet applications uh, like Dark, Dark Wallet uh, or the Samurai Wallet. Uh, they have a payment platform, TokenPay. They already also integrated this scheme into their payment platform. Uh, yeah, you may be more familiar with Monero. Uh, yeah, they, they, they exactly implement this dual key scheme. Uh, yeah, in their blockchain to ensure uh, the yeah receiver's privacy. Okay, so yeah, uh, this scheme actually works well on the Monero and other uh, other blockchain systems. However, when we consider our application, particularly for IoT, we are still facing some challenges we need to address. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you recall, you can see. This type of spills, uh, spills of transactions, you need to 
Uh, you need a node to constantly monitor blockchain, scan all the transactions to see whether this one is sent to me. They need to scan all the transactions. Uh, well, this works well for the more powerful servers running on the cloud or more powerful nodes. Uh, it's actually, it's not working for the for the IoT uh, due to the res uh, yeah, resource constraint of devices. Uh, you can never say the IoT device constantly doing something, right? It will run your battery very fast. So, which is our first first challenge? So, can we adapt the existing DOT scheme uh, to the blockchain-based IoT systems uh, by making certain trade-offs? So all the all the designs, whatever for security or scalability for the IoT, uh, you always need to make trade-off. There's no free lunch you can play here. Uh, also, the the second challenge is the transaction uh, use on the use use this this stills, stills address uh, can be easy, easily identified. Uh, remember here when, for those stills transaction, you have additional additional data you need to send. So, which means uh, on the blockchain networks full of the regular transactions without enables privacy feature, and the transactions with this still address feature enabled, you can you can easily differentiate differentiate between those two by use you by by looking at the additional data they are sending. Uh, so the the second question or challenge we are facing is can we uh, yeah, enhance the existing protocols. Uh, yeah, to in to further hiding the uh, sales transactions. So the technology we are we are using actually, I think everyone is quite familiar. Uh, if you consider the client server when they're talking, uh, yeah, most likely, or uh, they uh, nowadays you all use the TLS. Uh, they have uh, some uh, very popular technology within TLS, which can be used to accelerate the access of the client to the server, okay. which is a uh, session reassumption, okay. which is a very popular technology here. Uh, basically, you have two versions. You either can use session ID or use session ticket, depending on where you want to store that session information. So actually, we want to borrow, it, borrow this idea to the yeah, to our design. So to for for enable this idea on the yeah on the DOP setting, uh, actually you need to create uh, some way to scheduling scheduling your key. Okay. So on the host center and the yeah receiver side, uh, we have built this uh, key evolution schemes. Uh, Basically, the sender will send one ephemeral key pair uh, as a first initial transactions. So after first sales transactions, both parties get a shared secret. So instead of uh, instead of using a new generated ephemeral key for each transaction by the sender, uh, both parties will apply the hash function to update this common shared key still randomly for a number of Following sessions. Okay. This is uh, similar to the session resumption techniques. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah. That, yeah, I will skip this more complicated setting here. Uh, and uh, I just want to yeah, give you a high level idea and summarize what we are doing. Uh, again, you look at these transactions. Uh, this is the first one, sending by the, yeah, sending by the center. They will send the internal public key as part of the transactions. It's uh, your first uh, sales, tra uh, sales transactions. Later on, when they say I will send another transactions, yeah, they will yeah they will drop this one, and uh, because they will use this shared common secret for the following uh, number of transactions. So the following one will looks like a regular transaction. So the first transaction is. The sender can the actual sender can be identified. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, however, yeah, I want to uh, make you realize, uh, yeah, it's not free. So in this case, uh, both sender and uh, receiver they need a small table to maintain the uh, the state for a number of rounds. Yes. 
You said that after they exchange the first, I guess, handshake, they mm -hmm. compute um, the destination addresses consecutively after. So if the two ever get out of sync, mm -hmm. then they'll just basically need to re handshake. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. If they get yeah, lots of synchronization, for sure. That's why we, yeah, we keep the status, what's the latest transactions they, they made. Uh, yeah, quick summary. Uh, so this is uh, yeah, what we did. Uh, we, all the sales transactions are divided into two categories. Okay. Depending on whether this infirmary public is uh, introduced in the blocks. So the receiver uh, need to conduct same operations as the previous scheme uh, yeah, between the two blockchain nodes. And the sender uh, will generate uh, the uh, ephemeral key, uh, yeah, which only for the first connections. And uh, both receiver side, uh, the receiver only doing the quick uh, table lookup for the following connections. Uh, some uh, security properties. Uh, we still maintain the properties for the receiver anonymity, which means uh, for this for this scheme. Uh, if you still observe the uh, monitor the blockchain transactions, you cannot you, you still cannot link two transactions which sent to the same destination. Okay. We still maintain these properties. Also, yeah, we have the, the forward privacy, uh, which means if an attacker compromise a device during the your T key evolution, they cannot trace back for the previous transactions. Of course, they can follow your future transactions if, if, you, if they compromise your device in the middle. So this is this is a one trade-off we made. Uh, yeah, recall for the previous scheme, each time you generate a fresh key pair, whatever they compromise doesn't matter. But here, uh, they can they, they may they can follow your for number of following transactions. Okay. Uh, as a more subtle properties we we provide here is to hiding the further hiding the skills uh, transactions. Yeah, remember the first one is different can be differentiated from the normal transactions. For the following number of skills transactions, they are looks the same because you don't need to send that extra data as your infinite key. Uh, yeah, uh, we did some analysis in terms of the, uh, how many operations you need to do on the elliptic curve and uh, how many hash functions it, uh, computation you need to perform. And uh, yeah, this is a comparison uh, for the yeah, for the DOPC and average version. Uh, yeah, we wrote our own elliptic curve library uh, as, as is the EC283. K1, that's a, that's a curve. Uh, used in, in some IoT standard, for example, the ZP Smart Energy specification. Okay, so we use all the yeah opt optimization tactics uh, to make it faster, and uh, there's some tiny informations we tested. Is the library open source? Uh, yeah, yeah, we are still uh, doing very strict uh, code reviewing for this library, but uh, yeah, later on. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, this just gives you an idea uh, what's, uh, what, what we have gained here. Uh, similar to the TLS case, uh, we, the overall cost of the IoT version is less than 50% uh, of the original version. Also, you can save the transaction, uh, you can save the transaction values. Uh, we can save these many bytes uh, for the unconsecting transactions. So, because yeah, we don't need to send the new infirmary public key for every session. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we designed this IoT version of your key still address schemes. Uh, the idea is to doing a yeah, key evolution uh, and extend the lifetime of the common shared secret. However, uh, the trade-offs uh, both sender and receiver need to make a table uh, for their state. So we can achieve at least 50% performance improvement compared to the original scheme. Uh, however, yeah, we also can uh, we also can have significant reduction for the transaction size for the block. Okay, that's all.
Yep. Yes. So if I if I ignore the rest of the chain and only look at records that include the ephemeral key, mm -hmm. um, can I identify which receiver because receiver are anonymity. Receiver is not anonymous at that one from that, right? Uh, still not anonymous. Right. Yeah, still not anonymous. Because you know, for that for that transaction containing the ephemeral key, uh, the receiver needs to scan the blockchain to see which one is sent to him. It's a it's the same as previous one. Well, previous, uh, yeah, but it's uh, only for the, the first one. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so finally we are here. How big is the table? Uh, so yeah, that's a very good question. For LT device, you may think that that's a, uh, that's very resource constrained, right? Uh, however, if you think about the typical applications like smart building, you may have the hundreds of those sensors. Right? That's that table is actually uh, quite uh, quite compact in, for hundreds of nodes. But if you if you say uh, you have millions of nodes, they both need to talk to the other millions of nodes. That's no way. Right? But if you think how many how many transactions you you are regularly sent for in your regular life, you may send tens of transactions to your friends, right? Yeah, you never can reach like millions of those transactions. So we think in the in the practice, in the real world of LT applications and uh, the capability of the current uh, LT device, we think it's uh, affordable. Now we have a few more minutes for questions to build it over we got there soon, so uh, any questions? How many do you guys hire? What kind of talent do you look for? Oh, uh, yeah. Don't you want to <laughs> say? <laughs> you pay in tokens plus salary. Yeah, yeah, that's basically the model. I think you, you guys are very clever with that. And also, in addition to that, we are also trying to uh, get uh, community records as well. And uh, because right now our blockchain code is open source, and, uh, and uh, if you are interested in look up the code, and uh, feel free to correct any. Uh, Problems and uh, create a PR, and uh, all all the contributions are appreciated. And also, uh, if you uh, and and also if you have a uh, very big contribution, you possibly like uh, implement some of the big features, and uh, we can also reward tokens as well. And also, we are hiring uh, full timers as well. And uh, it's not very far; it's only two hours away. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you guys in Palo Alto or? Uh, Metal Park. Very close. Okay, good. That's one. But I don't know. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you, Artex.